on this edition of It's a Miracle. A deputy sheriff attempts to detain a mentally ill suspect and walks straight into an ambush. That's when the room just lit up with a flash. It was very, very slow. It was a flash, three rapid shots fired. But the officer had some unauthorized backup on his side that day. An angel watching over him and protecting him from certain death. Plus, if a cat has nine lives, can it use some of them to save its owners? I just remember getting woke up by Dogwood, pulling the covers off my face. And then he led her down the hall to a terrifying discovery. <gasps> and while walking home one day, Danny Umensetter suddenly passed out, only to discover that he was dying from an incurable disease. He said that Danny had alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. He didn't give him much of a chance. He said he'd be in a wheelchair and uh, then that he would be dead. But his doctors were wrong, and Danny would become living proof that we all have the power to perform miracles. These stories and more on this edition of It's a Miracle. Oh, it's a miracle, a miracle Happening to everyday people Changing their lives forever It's a miracle And now, from PAX TV Studio 611, your host, Richard Thomas. Good evening, and welcome to It's a Miracle. You know, depending on who you ask, the word miracle can mean many things. It can be as complicated as a series of fantastical events that defy all rational explanation, or as simple as a promise of hope in a time of despair. Well, tonight, you're going to experience a wide variety of miracles and meet the people whose lives were touched by them. We start with an example of the simplest type, an act of human kindness. And as you'll see, sometimes when people open their hearts to each other, miracles can happen. In 1985, Danny Umensetter was an average, healthy, 36-year-old man who enjoyed sports and athletics until one day, while walking up a hill near his home in LaGrange, Kentucky, he suddenly passed out. Danny woke up on his back. His wife, Kathy, remembers how things went downhill from there. He would get so out of breath so fast from not doing that much, and we knew that that couldn't be right. Danny Umensetter? Uh-huh, it's me. And so we went to a series of doctors trying to help him to feel better, pretty much to no avail. What were they saying? I didn't say a whole lot. They just said I was getting older. One doctor after another failed to diagnose Danny's illness. His daughter, Carrie, watched helplessly as her father's condition deteriorated. That's it. That's it. It was like breathing with a wet rag over his face 24 hours a day that he couldn't get a full, deep breath of air. It wasn't until his wife became ill that Danny finally discovered what was wrong. My mother was sick and went to the hospital. Kathy? And the doctor heard my dad coughing. Excuse me, sir. Can I ask you a few questions? The young intern on duty that day took the time to examine Danny and suggested that he be tested for a rare lung disease, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Eleven days later, they met with a pulmonologist. The test results were not good. He said that Danny had alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. He didn't give him much of a chance. He said he'd be in a wheelchair and uh, then that he would be dead. Danny will continue to lose lung capacity. Danny was suffering from an inherited form of emphysema, and his lungs had already been severely damaged. The doctor gave him only a 50% chance of living three to five years. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. No. Oh, no, it's OK. There's, there's something we can do. But Danny took the news in stride. And rather than thinking about himself, he focused on what he could do for his family in the short time he had left. 
And that's when he made a startling decision. Girls, I think we're going to build us a house. What? That pretty much traumatized me. I just thought, oh, please, not one more thing. You know, it's enough to deal with that you're sick. This would kill you. I just didn't see how on earth we could do it. But Danny wanted to die knowing that his family was safe and secure in a new home. He chose a plot of land in a small subdivision called Persimmon Ridge. It was a decision that would have a profound and miraculous effect on the rest of his life, something that no one could have predicted, and that would leave an entire community cheering. The conclusion, when it's a miracle, continues. When 36-year-old Danny Amonsetter was struck down by a deadly lung disease, he decided to spend the short time he had left to live building a home for his family. He chose a small community called Persimmon Ridge and met with the developer, Lauren Just. At that time, he was carrying an oxygen tank. It kind of threw me off a little bit. He said, well, I'm, I'm dying, so I need a place for my wife and daughter to be in a nice community where Neighbors speak to each other and take care of each other. As construction began, Danny started meeting his neighbors, and they were immediately impressed by his courage and determination. Doug and Susan Smith were building nearby. We were both building our houses, and he happened to pull up out front one day and introduced himself. Hey, Danny. Danny, hey, Doug Smith. Hey, hey, meet you. Doug, nice to meet you, too. And he pretty bluntly told me what his situation was, and it was kind of astounding to me to think of a person who's looking at the possibility of dying any time building a house. Yeah, it's coming along. While Danny continued to personally supervise the construction of their home, his wife Kathy spent her time investigating possible treatments. Thank you. Luckily, after enough phone calls are made, you do find some help. Kathy's research led her to a new experimental procedure, a double lung transplant, and the director of the lung transplant program at Barnes Jewish Hospital in St. Louis, yes. Dr. Bert yes, Trulon. My husband has a condition and we're desperately seeking some help. When Danny was evaluated for transplantation, his lung function was about 20% of normal for a man his age. And that was on a progressively downward trend. Uh, unfortunately, there's a critical shortage of donor organs. And approximately 15% of patients die every year without a transplant. The expected delay for transplantation when Danny was on the waiting list was in the range of probably 15 to 18 months. But Danny couldn't even walk up the driveway of his newly completed home. It was during this time that his new neighbors began to rally around him. It's kind of hard to keep his grass wet the whole time, and it's going to die. Dennis Sherrod lived across the street. We used to cut his grass. If he needed something picked up, we'd pick it up. We moved furniture from upstairs to downstairs. I mean, all kinds of things like that. These simple acts of kindness kept Danny's spirits alive. Soon, months passed. And as Danny neared the top of the donor waiting list, it was necessary for him to move to St. Louis to be near the hospital. Since Kathy's job as a kindergarten teacher was their only source of income, Carrie would accompany him. I had to work, but through the goodness of the neighbors, I would go every weekend to see Danny. They would make sure that one of them rode up with me or that I had plane tickets. They wanted to make sure we could be together. People would bring checks to my house so that she could fly every Friday to St. Louis to spend the weekend with Danny and Carrie. Careful. Papa, I love you. Unfortunately, Kathy was not present when Danny was finally given the news they'd been praying for. A donor had been found, and surgery was scheduled immediately. Yeah. They probably need your wedding band off, too. When he removed his wedding band and my mom wasn't there, it was the first time he showed fear. You know, that he was afraid that he wasn't going to make it. <laughs> 
hang on to that, okay? That was probably the hardest thing I know for him is to go through that without my mom. But once again, a neighbor came to the rescue. Dennis Sherrod drove Kathy the 200 miles to St. Louis to be near her husband during the operation. Meanwhile, the rest of the community waited and prayed. We didn't think he'd come back. His health had deteriorated so badly. But the seven-hour operation went smoothly. Danny's body accepted the new lungs, and his subsequent recovery was nothing less than phenomenal. Everything was successful. I was only in the hospital 12 days. I was kind of like a poster boy. Everything went so good. All right. Danny's return Check home would be an emotional moment for everyone in the community. The whole neighborhood was just ecstatic, really. I had yellow ribbons tied all along the entrance oh, to the great. development, and um, everyone was tying yellow ribbons ar around trees. We kind of knew about when to expect them and kept watching. Finally, they came in, and everybody started coming out of their house. Oh, this is cool. Stop the car, baby. Stop the car. <laughs> when he got out of the car, the bottom of the driveway, and he just started running up the hill. It was something that Danny had never expected to be able to do again, and it would not have been possible if it weren't for the miraculous love and support his neighbors had given him. The miracle is just the way people take care of you, look after you, and care about you, people you don't even know. I don't know how everything fell into place for us to have moved here. It had to have been more at work than just good luck. It had to have been a miracle for us to have moved and found neighbors like we found. As much as Danny's life has been changed by the kindness of his neighbors, their lives have changed as well. Almost everybody in the subdivision now have all signed their donor cards and are aware of the transplant program because they know it works. Without someone being kind of to give me their lungs, I wouldn't be here today. I'm four years out, and uh, so this is four years of life that I've gotten that I wouldn't have gotten otherwise. Danny got to see Carrie graduate. So many things he would have missed if it hadn't been for our donor. That success that he had from the surgery, from the doctors, the network of the neighbors, our family, everything included, it just seemed like an enormous miracle. It couldn't have happened any better, you know, if it had to. The wonderful thing about the story you've just seen is that it's about a miracle that any of us can give to each other, simply through acts of human kindness. I wanted to meet some of the people who gave that gift to Danny Umensetter, and so they're joining us from Persimmon Ridge, Kentucky. Hello, everybody. Hey. Hey. Hello. Hello. Well, after seeing your story, I have a feeling half the country's going to be moving to Persimmon Ridge. How do you feel about that? That'd Sounds be great. great. Yeah. Yeah. More than Mary. I hope so. Great. Well, now it's time to tell the truth. What was Danny really like when you were all giving him that support? <laughs> well, no, that's a dangerous question right there. I'm sure, not yeah. He's kind of the he's kind of the core that's brought us all together. To be quite frank, I think it was kind of an act of God that he came in the way he was, and the things happened just brought us closer together. Has he changed any since all this happened? Oh, it's a, it's a 180 degree <laughs> turn. I mean, his meanness is still intact. It's, uh, it's it's never changed. Still cheats at golf too. And he's always good yeah. for a joke. Okay, it's your turn, Danny. Is there any truth to the rumor that these aren't really a bunch of neighbors, but they're actually a band of angels? Well, I'd say that's exactly right. I mean, it's, uh, it's just, it's a feeling, like I say, you can't really describe, but for what they did and helped us and all they've done for us is, it's really unbelievable. How's your health today? I'm doing great, feeling good. Um, you know, the things, the quality of life now is much better than it was before the operation. There's just no comparison. We just hope that by watching this, that folks would be able to sign their donor card and feel that it would be worthwhile because they can see what a difference it makes in so many people's lives. Yes, sure. Absolutely. Well, I hope that the people watching will consider that. Thanks for sharing your story with us. Well, thanks for coming to yes. our home. Thank you. Stay with us for more stories of miracles right after this. Still to come. A young boy suffering from incurable cancer makes a dying wish. He said that he wanted to become a healing angel and he wanted to help kids who were 
in as much pain as he was in. And his dream comes true in a most remarkable way. And next, the story of a cat who loved to play hide and seek, a game that just may have saved its owner's lives. I just remember getting woke up by a dogwood, pulling the covers off my face. And then he led her down the hall to a terrifying discovery. <gasps> And a child claims to have seen an angel. Taylor told me that God talks to us through angels. I've never personally seen an angel myself. I think that they are with us and they work through people and do speak to some people that are blessed. And whether it's true or not, one thing is certain. What the angel told her that day saved her father's life as It's a Miracle continues. And now, once again, Richard Thomas. Our next story came to us from a viewer responding to our campaign, America's Search for Miracles. Lyle Mayfield wrote that, we recently saw your solicitation for miracle stories over Channel 13 in Mount Vernon, Illinois, where we regularly watch It's a Miracle. We would like to submit the enclosed true story for your consideration. Well, Lyle's story intrigued us, as I'm sure it will intrigue you. It's a perfect example of how miracles come in all shapes and sizes. A basket full of kittens is hard to resist. And in 1980, while visiting his son, Lyle Mayfield discovered just how irresistible they can be. They're adorable. The female cat he had, had produced a litter of several kittens, and this little runt of the litter came to me and acted like he wanted to be with me, and I just felt like he was kind of picking me out. Cats adopt people, people don't adopt cats. And this kitten had found itself a new home. Actually, I didn't bring him home the first day. I came home and told Doris about him. Especially one, and he, he came right to me. I said, he's such a cute little fellow, and he's kind of the run of the litter, and he's getting left out of everything. So I said, would you mind if I brought him home? Oh, 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 Doris agreed, but with one condition. We just decided right from the start that he would not mess up my house, and I didn't want a litter box so it wouldn't smell. And so we just put it out every couple hours, summer and winter, and he learned. He was an outdoor cat with an outdoor name. It was in the spring of the year, and I was aware of the dogwood trees in bloom. And he had this spot on top of his head that reminded me of a dogwood blossom, so I called him Dogwood. And it wasn't long till the name was shortened to Dog. While Dog would grow to become a one-man cat, there was a special game he would only play with Doris. Our family room has two doors, and the cat would go down to the end of the hall, and I'd go down to the other end. Oh, peek! It'd peek at me and you know, go around the other side, and we'd play a game like that. And just hide and seek, we called it. But other than the game, Dog would learn to never bother Doris, especially at night. If he wanted to go outside, it was always Lyle who got up and let him out. Let's go. We'll go outside. And then, one night, Dogwood's usual behavior changed. On that night, Doris stoked the fire, closed the vent so that it would burn slowly until morning, shut the family room doors, and went to bed. I just remember a couple hours later getting woke up by Dogwood, pulling the covers off my face. I'd pull him back up again, and I'd tell him to get away, or tell Lyle to go, to go outside. But that night, Dog let sleeping Lyle lay, and continued to oh, pester shit. Doris into getting up. And I finally just got up and said, oh, come on, Dogwood, I'll take you out. But instead of heading for the front door, Dogwood took off down the hall for the family room. And I thought, what's that cat going there for? Come on, Dogwood, I'm not going to play games with you tonight. And he wouldn't come, so I opened up the door, and there's smoke. <gasps> well, the next thing I recall is Doris waking me up, saying, hey, the house is filling up with smoke. And it was strong smoke. 
and it was coming into the hall. Of course, our bedroom is only a few feet from the entrance to the family room. Oh, my God. And we opened up the doors and windows. It took a while to get the stuff out of the house. I honestly think that if we hadn't been awakened, that the smoke would have gotten to us. And smoke inhalation can get you real quick. Any fireman will tell you that. I just feel like it was meant to be. And he was meant to wake us up. But why did Dogwood choose to wake Doris instead of Lyle that night? I feel like Dogwood knew that I would go in there if he would head into that room, thinking that I was going to play this game with him and finding the smoke. Dogwood's quick thinking that night may have saved two lives. And for Doris, there's only one explanation for his extraordinary behavior. It's like it was a miracle he came in there and come to my side of the bed because usually I always woke up Lyle to go outside. Dog was a real special cat. <laughs> well, he was special to me before that. But after that, he was my hero. And Dogwood lived a hero's life until 1991, when at the age of 11, he became seriously ill. One of the saddest days of my life was the day that I had to have him put down because he had cancer. I carried him two blocks up the street here to the vet's office, and I cried every foot of the way up there. This is where Dogwood is buried. After Dogwood died, we felt he needed a place to where he could be remembered. We'd, we'd think of him often. Dogwood, I actually think, miraculously saved mine and Doris's life. And uh, he deserves a special place in our, in our lives and in our memory. Coming up, the dying wish of a young boy is granted when his car is auctioned for charity. The beginning of a journey that ends in a miraculous twist of fate. If you believe in miracles, and I believe in miracles, you can't help but believe that Mark really had a lot to do with this. And later, a sudden and unexpected armed confrontation with a mentally disturbed suspect leaves a deputy fighting for his life. I shouldn't even be sitting here talking to anybody. I should be meeting my maker right now. Find out the amazing miracle that saved his life when It's a Miracle continues. Often, when someone we love dies, we keep something they owned and cherished, a memento to remember them by. And that object, whatever it is, can hold all the emotions and memories associated with that person. But can it also hold a special power? Can it be used by the dead to communicate with the living, to send a message from beyond, to ease their pain and loss? Our next story answers those questions in a powerful and unforgettable way. Mark Buncozzi was only 14 years old when he was diagnosed with liver cancer. With the love and support of his family, he valiantly fought the disease that was ravaging his young body. When we were told that it was moving to his lungs and then it was moving to the bone, it seemed totally out of our hands. And um, the news just kept getting worse. I couldn't believe how well he handled it. He, he just thought that he'll beat it. This is a 65 Mark's father, Bella, shared his son's passion for vintage Mustangs, and they decided to make a special project out of restoring a used one. It was a project that kept his mind off of his cancer because it was something tangible that he could work towards. So the two of them had been spending a lot of time together doing that, looking for the perfect car for him. And here is the 65. The car Mark chose for himself was a classic 1965 Mustang that needed work but had plenty of potential. The goal was to have the car finished when he was a senior in high school. I think we could do it together, Dad. We could do it together, son. No problem. And together, father and son restored the Mustang from top to bottom, inside and out, repainting the car a dazzling new color that Mark chose himself. Acapulco Blue. I wanted him to make the decisions 
as much as he could because he had no decisions making abilities with his disease. And Mark was making the decisions with Bela's help, so it was a wonderful time of growing closer together. Yes, sir. And one area was that he wanted to have a good stereo because he loved music. And he saved the old radio, the AM radio that came with the car, and he wrapped it up and he said, we'll save that in case we ever want to show the car. I could just see on him that he forgot about his troubles. And I did too. That was the greatest part of the whole, whole project. When they finished it and we were going on a trip to get the car registered, that was the ta-da, this is the car, it's perfect. And they wouldn't even let me sit in the front seat. I had to sit in the back because the two of them had to sit up front. This was such a gratifying moment to see him so happy, knowing what's ahead of us. That was a great day. Go ahead, stay there. Easy, easy, okay. And as soon as the car got finished, I let him drive in the parking lot to get the feel of the car. But by this time, he was pretty sick. The cancer has migrated to his bones and it was very difficult to handle the clutch. I have this down. It was the beginning of the end. Mark's body was shutting down. He was dying. And he kept saying, please don't cry, because he said he could deal with dying, but he couldn't deal with the fact that he knew how much pain his dying would cause us. That was, that was really tough when he said that. Yeah. Oh, that was, he just showed his sensitivity. Uh, to people around him, that he didn't want to hurt others. What was happening, it was very hard. Mark had wanted to be a doctor ever since he was a little boy. When he realized that he probably would never become a doctor, he said that he wanted to become a healing angel and he wanted to help kids who were in as much pain as he was in and who were afflicted with incurable diseases. With his parents by his side, Mark finally succumbed to his cancer on December 19, 1993. He was only 16 years old and never got the chance to drive his beloved Mustang on his own. After Mark died, the car was kept polished and washed and we had it parked in the garage and it brought us pain instead of joy because it was a silent testament of, of all the pain that we had gone through. And yet, we couldn't bear to see somebody else driving it. But Mark's car had an amazing destiny to fulfill, one that would bring his parents a message from beyond, the conclusion when it's a miracle continues. When Mark Bunkosi was diagnosed with incurable liver cancer, he and his father embarked on a special project that would help Mark take his mind off his deadly disease. Together, they faithfully restored a 1965 Mustang. But sadly, Mark would die before he was ever able to drive it on his own. For the next two years, the car sat silently in the Bunkosi's garage, a painful testament to the final months they'd shared with their only son. And then a friend, Cheryl Walsh, made a thoughtful suggestion. Why not donate the car to an upcoming fundraiser for the American Cancer Society? It was a very difficult thing to ask somebody to do, to give up a car that was, had a lot of meaning to them. Um, but they agreed to do it. It would do more good for us to donate the car to raise money for the Cancer Society than it did having it sit in our garage. And so um, that's what we decided to do. We had it as the premier item for the evening and had a sign on it saying that this car was restored by uh, Mark Bancosi, who had died of cancer. It was a very touching uh, item to have there, and I think everybody then got the sense that the cancer ball was about curing cancer. Going to the gala was very, very difficult. It meant that we were going to say goodbye to the car, 
even though we had decided that we were going to give it away, it was still so final and it brought back memories of Mark dying. It was a tremendously emotional evening. Oh, thank you so much for coming. The car went for $15,000, so we were really thrilled at the amount of money that the car was able to raise that evening. And it was purchased by the honorary chairman of the event that night, Bruce Holly. Thank you. So Thank much. you so much. But I think what was really wonderful was to see Eva and Bela go out and shake hands with the Hollies and really kind of share that moment. We felt like it was what Mark would want us to do, and he would be happy with, with what we did. It was probably a year, year and a half after we had donated the car that I got a call from our friend Cheryl. And she said, you're not going to believe this, but I just purchased a raffle ticket for a 65 Mustang that was donated in memory of Irma Bombeck to benefit the Kidney Foundation. And she said, I'm positive it's your car. We decided to look into it a little further, found out then that they had gotten the car from the University of Arizona, who had received the car from the Hollies, who had given it to them in order to raise more money for cancer. This time, Mark's Mustang raised over $20,000 for a grand total of more than $60,000 between the three fundraisers. Tracy called today. And then one day, Bela came home from work and he was looking through the paper. I normally don't look at classifieds at all. And as I went down, and my eyes just stopped, the 65 Mustang in perfect condition. I knew it was his car. I don't know how I knew, I just knew it was his car. Bela made arrangements to see the Mustang the next day. I could see the car on the, on the driveway. And that's in Mark's car. Perfect condition as it was when, uh, when it left. Oh, Bella, that's Mark's car. And my heart was overwhelmed with joy. You know, this car has a real interesting history. The man selling the car was initially unaware that Bela and Eva were the original owners. He began to tell the history of the vehicle and described how he had won it off a $25 raffle ticket at a fundraiser. I'm not much into cars. It's been sitting in my garage, and I'm ready to sell. I had not seen a smile like that on Bela's face in many years. He was just lit up from inside at... Uh, being able to drive his car again. It's Everything there. was taken away, we left it. This is the original radio. The original radio that Mark wrapped up was in the trunk, untouched, just like the way it was. I'm going to check something. And the odometer read 700 miles, 700 miles. more than when uh, the car was donated. Is that possible? This is possible. <laughs> <laughs> the car was never really driven for any other purpose than from go to one charity to another charity. What a healing process for Eva and Bela to know that their son, who had always said, I want to be able to give back, I want to help others, had really helped others. And then for it to show up through the newspaper in such a miraculous way, you can't help but believe that Mark really had a lot to do with this. If you believe in miracles, and I believe in miracles, you got to believe that it made its journey and it came home for the right reasons. Now the car is a total joy. I drive it all the time. It was like a gift that was being returned to us by our son. It was as though he said, I wanted money for charity. You missed the car. It's my way of saying, hey, Dad, I'm OK and here's a gift from me to you. I truly believe that that's what happened, because that's what Mark would do. As you've just seen, a parent's relationship with their child is a very strong, emotional, and unending bond. And when we return, a five-year-old child reveals the depth of that bond when she saves her father's life with the help of a miracle. We'll be right back. In their dangerous line of work, police officers must use every type of protection available, the latest weapons, bulletproof vests, and sometimes even guardian angels. 
That's what happens in our next story when a deputy's five-year-old daughter brings him an urgent message that ultimately saves his life. May 1st, 1998, Tulsa, Oklahoma Deputy Sheriff Randy Pierce was getting ready for work when his five-year-old daughter, Taylor, walked into the room with his bulletproof vest. Daddy, please wear this vest. I told her, honey, I don't have any dangerous assignments today. I don't need it. It's hot outside. And she goes, Daddy, put your vest on and do it now. I'll burn up in that vest. She's just very persistent saying, about it. You know how hot it is out there? Come on, just wear it. Why? She was whining and rather than argue with her, I just went ahead and did it. Later, when he dropped his daughter off at daycare, Taylor, who normally loved school, became visibly upset. Oh, Daddy's got to go to work. Daddy's going to go. No, 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 no. You she just started crying, saying, Daddy, Daddy, please don't go. And I, I have to go to work, honey. Randy's first assignment that day was to serve an emergency detention order on a 71-year-old man who'd barricaded himself inside his home. Uh, he wasn't eating, didn't have any electricity, phone. Uh, all the neighbors would worry about him. The judge had issued a forcible entry warrant to take him into protective custody. Randy's partners that day were deputies Kyle Hess and Garland Thompson. While Garland moved to the rear of the home, Randy and Kyle approached the front door. Mr. Jones. Good morning, Mr. Jones. Kyle noticed immediately that the man was unbalanced. No, 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 no. Mr. Jones, we're with the police. We need you no uh, was real hot. It was 98, some odd degrees outside, and he's wearing caps and coats, saying that people's poisoning his food. You just want to do everything else. You want plastic, give him some more plastic poisoning. No, 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 no. I actually told him I could test his food for him, and he wouldn't come out and open the door or anything like that. I tell you what, Mr. Jones, we're, we're not going to do anything. We're just inches away from him. And we just need that door open so we can just snatch him and take him to the proper facility. We want to make sure everything's OK in your house. At that moment, Garland returned to the front of the house and offered a new strategy. It's all blocked off back there. He said, we get him now. I told Randy to pull the screen door and would get him out of the house, right there. They are after me. They want to get me. No, no, no. But they miscalculated the reaction time of the old man, who slammed the door on Randy's foot. I started trying to kick the door off to get it off my foot, and the door just breached right open. Randy burst into a room that was dark and still. As his eyes adjusted, he suddenly saw his quarry standing 10 feet away, pointing a 45 caliber pistol at him. That's when the room just lit up with a flash. And it was very, very slow. It was a flash, three rapid shots fired. The force of the gunshots threw Randy back out the door. While Kyle positioned himself to cover the house, Garland radioed for an ambulance and backup. He was rolling on the ground on his back from side to side. I knew he was hurt. I could see the blood. With no time to spare, Garland braved the gunfire from the house to drag his partner to safety. I started praying. I prayed very hard. I prayed that we'd all get out there alive and that I'd see my daughter again. Two of the bullets had hit Randy in the arms, severing arteries. There's a lot of blood coming out of Randy, just pouring out of his arms at this time. So I put pressure bandages on his wounds. Once the ambulance arrived, Randy was rushed to a local hospital where medical personnel were amazed that he was still alive. The doctors told me that due to the bullets in the arms that had severed the arteries, that if they wouldn't have had pressure applied to them at the scene. With the amount of blood loss, I would have had brain damage in three to four minutes and died shortly after that. Bruises over his heart and right kidney revealed where the bulletproof vest had also saved his life. Without the vest, I wouldn't be here right now. I'd be dead. There were two lethal shots. Taylor's mother, Darla, picked her daughter up at daycare on her way to the hospital. I told her that her father had been hurt and we were on our way to the emergency room. The doctor's gonna take good care of him. Are his arms okay? And 
I looked at her kind of funny because I hadn't mentioned anything at all about him being shot in his arms. And I said, well, yeah, sweetie, Daddy is bleeding, but we're going to get to the emergency room and we're going to pray on the way. And that's what we did. The man who shot Randy surrendered two and a half hours later and is now confined to a state mental hospital. It would take five operations to eventually repair Randy's damaged arms. Baby, look who's home. But it wasn't until he arrived home that his daughter finally revealed oh. the miracle that had saved his life. You. Oh. She goes, Daddy, if I tell you something, will you think I'm stupid? I said, no, honey, I'll never think you're stupid. You know that morning when you left for work? Taylor told him how she had been playing in her room that morning as he prepared for work, when three angels appeared. They were standing by me. They looked like a ghost, so I could see through them. And then one of them spoke. Angel told me to pick up his robe vest and give it to him. Taylor did exactly what the angel had told her to do, and she wouldn't take no for an answer. Taylor told me that God talks to us through angels. That's how he speaks to us. I've never personally seen an angel myself. I think that they are with us, and they work through people and do speak to some people that are blessed. And then later, when you dropped me off, she appeared again. Taylor also told her father about a second vision she'd had on the day of the shooting. She was playing at the daycare center when a single angel appeared. Um, she had white hair. She was real bright, like the sun. Is he going to be OK? Taylor says the angel told her that her father had been wounded in the arms, but not to worry. I believe that Taylor did witness angels that appeared to her to beg her father to wear his bulletproof vest. It wasn't his time to go, and he's been given a second chance. A second chance that would not have been possible if a young child hadn't listened to the voice of an angel. It's a miracle that it even happened. I shouldn't even be sitting here talking to anybody. I should be meeting my maker right now. Daddy, you're home. Yeah, I am home. I missed you. I missed you, too. Yeah. Well, Daddy's home now. We'll be right back. That's our show for this evening. Thank you for joining us, and a special thanks to all the people who shared their remarkable stories tonight on It's a Miracle. It's our hope that whenever you need one, you'll find a miracle in your life, too. Until next time, I'm Richard Thomas. Good night.